Chapter Twenty Four of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Last Lift Home. I took a last look back at Cocking from the top of the hill. Under my feet there was the thymy grass of the South Downs. A little way down the steep slope, thin parallel lines of white began, sheep ruts that had been there for ages. These gradually broadened and multiplied until, a quarter of a mile from where I stood, they formed a homogeneous track, and then a hard white road which wound down and lost itself among the red roofs of the village. What a day, I thought to myself, for the last day of my journey. All sign of yesterday's unkindly mood had vanished. A sky of unsullied azure stretched above my head. There was not enough breeze to move a star of thistledown the sunshine wantoned around me and somewhere above everywhere in very truth and nowhere that i could certainly discover larks were singing in one unbroken flow of music true sussex downland lark music not to be matched by any other in the length and breadth of the land there was a veneer of dew upon the grass white and sparkling like frosted silver i slung my boots to my shoulder and strode on barefooted and bareheaded through the sweet morning air a regiment of greenfinches chippered on before me from bush to bush linnets made a slender tweeting in the gorse brakes far overhead a great company of jackdaws sailed by rabbits struck across the path incessantly my feet broke the gossamer at every stride and looking backward there lay my trail as far as i could see a double string of green ovals bruised in the shining white here the downs soar far into the blue sky four or five hundred feet perhaps and maintained this altitude almost unbroken for miles it was my design to keep to the hilltops going always eastward until hunger should drive me down into the valley again whether to north or south it mattered not a jot but as yet the day was only in its first fresh glow of youth and beauty the whole morning lay before me in which to renew my ancient joy in these glad solitudes i pushed onward breasting the hot sweet air and sunshine drinking in the fragrance and the melody that earth and sky were interchanging wondering what would happen to a man whose entire life could be passed forgotten and forgetful of all other human beings here on the green roof tree of the world it will hardly have escaped the vigilance nor perhaps the censure of the reader that in this chronicle i have had much the same difficulty with sheep bells as mr dick with king charles's head on such a journey this was inevitable the music of the sheep bells formed almost as common a part of my daily fare as the bread i ate and was well nigh as indispensable the old bee-master cannot live far from the song of his hives nor can the sussex downlander endure for long the neighbourhood of hill and dale bereft of his native bell music if you do not know the deep satisfaction inherent in either of these things well you do not know and there is an end to it but constantly at odd turns of the way and at odd moments when there was nothing farther from my mind the old familiar sound would peal out welcome as sunshine in the midst of a shadowed day 
and if there is a page here without its sheep bells it is because i put a discreetly muffling hand upon them not because the soft heart-quickening music failed then in fact or now in memory on these green heights and far below in the violet misted coombs i came upon many flocks of sheep and the bells were never out of hearing all the morning through no sooner had one clanging chorus died away then i began to draw into the zone of another symphony three hours and more i wandered along those green rampart tops and there was never a moment but had its dying cadence just at the year's stretch far behind or its new bell song lifting faintly out of some gilded hollow still to traverse i had asked myself what manner of man would be evolved by such an environment perpetuated throughout a whole lifetime and i had but to look around me at the shepherds as they loitered over their highland pastures crook in hand and dog at heel when you first go a rambling in the south down country you are like to be brought up early and sharply by an astounding yet indisputable thing yourself may have met with no living creature for an hour or more and coming into some secret hollow of the hills where a shepherd leans upon his crook his sheep feeding before him you reflect that here is a man who in all likelihood has been alone since dawn he must be starving for companionship the mere sound of a human voice will be to him meat and drink of your charity you go out of the way to exchange a word with him in his loneliness as you would feel constrained to give the cup of cold water to a beggar at your door your confidence then is as profound as will be your bewilderment a moment later for this poor solitary far from rejoicing at your advent receives you with the plainest and coolest unconcern calm-eyed deliberate of speech studiously civil he yet conveys to you at once and unmistakably that he values your room as much as your fellowship he returns your greeting courteously enough all your advances have their due rejoinder but plainly he had been just as well pleased if you had passed by in the distance with a mere wave of the hand plainly nothing had so well contented him now as that you should be gone and leave him to his sheep and empty hills and clamouring doors this peculiarity is all but universal among the shepherds of the south downs down in the lowlands ploughman or carter or stockman they are all glad and ready to pass the time of day with you and give you back sally for sally to your heart's content their work seems to beget the same craving for intercourse as human work needs all the world over but there is something in the life of a downland shepherd that makes him mentally independent of his fellows he is alone but obviously he loves to be alone invariably he is a man of thought but his thoughts are his own thoughts and he neither desires to share them with another nor to get your views at second hand he will stop up on those bare hills from dawn till dusk and then if he goes to the inn after folding time he will sit and smoke his pipe the most silent and least interested member of the company somehow or other he gets his daily fill of whatever it is that urges all other human creatures the very beasts and birds even to comradeship and feels no farther need it is a subtle an evasive problem the shepherd's is a calling that descends from father to son 
generation after generation and heredity may have evolved a special self-sufficient man for this most solitary and exacting task but consider what is the chief influence that surrounds and pervades the work of the south down shepherd we all know the power of music on heart and mind of music as an art science i am not qualified to speak the word to me has no significance beyond its grouping of tones into simple melody or wild unrhythmic concourses of sweet sound and probably to the great body of the naturally educated it is the power of suggestion in music rather than its didacticism that counts in the scheme of a progressive world in my own case let it stand for self-condemnation if you will i have listened to the more abstruse wagnerianisms unenlightened not a little bewildered while the sound of a barrel organ playing swanee river in the distance has straightway opened for me the very gates of paradise consider then that the south down shepherd boy and youth and man has passed his life amid the unceasing music of the sheep bells consider that one rich wavering peal of this same music drifting over the wind-washed hills will bring a glow to your cheek and set all your thoughts into unheard-of happy trespassing and then consider what must happen to a man sensitive skilful of a sturdy originality of mind for the craft of shepherding demands all these and more whose daily work anchors him in the very midst of this influence and holds him there with little more to do than yield himself to its incessant prompting no less powerful because unsuspected and unfelt the wonder is that the shepherd class has given us so few poets and imaginative writers but the shepherd is nature's child and the natural human instinct is to make of thought an end in itself it goes no farther than speech at most it was well after noon when i began to cast hungry looks over the steep hillsides for any sign of a village that might contain an inn i came down northward into the weald again by much the same sort of road as i had left it at cocking but here the track descended through hanging beech woods now almost destitute of leaves hazel copses bare to the searching sunbeams hedgerows that carried only grey garlands of traveller's joy the scarlet of hip and hoar the rosy flower fruits of the spindle tree it came to me then and with almost a shock of surprise that i had really left the autumn behind me and that it was winter at last though the sun struck so warm upon my face and the birds carolled so blithely around me though not a fleck of cloud dimmed the azure nor one harsh note sounded in the trees though the cattle loitered about in the pastures and the old horses had not forsaken the shady meadow nooks still it was winter and christmas loomed but six short weeks ahead the village whose grey church tower i had seen from the heights lay a mile or so out on the green level of the weald tramping towards it through the quiet lanes this first thought of winter seemed to tinge the whole face of nature for me in the song of the birds in the hedgerows and the larks in the blue i thought to detect that evanescent opportunist quality which is the mark of the new season the idle wind in the tree-tops sent down the thrumming thin complaint of bare branches not the full melody of leaf-laden boughs that stop the air like the sails of a ship day by day 
i had been steadily drawing away from the rich warm zone of the west and now i had won me my own highland country and winter together i knew every rooftop of the village to which my feet were wending i trod the doorstep of the inn with all the assurance of an old familiar guest in days gone by i had never looked upon the cheerful face of the widow who kept that inn without commiseration towards its dead and gone master on the curtailment of what ought to have been if it had not been a happy life she was an old woman now wrinkled and grey-haired still sturdy though extraordinarily obese but her eyes were the eyes of a young woman still clear and bright and full you could almost say of the untried hope of girlhood while her laugh reminded you of the song of thrushes at eve she leant over the half door that divided the bar from the little sunny parlour watching me regale her chin in one hand and the other musically jingling her keys ye ne'er had a bite like that afore quoth she in the high sing-song drawl of the sussex tis for your old weather and true south down bred out o harkham farm tis where old mast miles but that'n's all come about sin ye happen through last old miles i were wrong side o sixty but i knowed enough to wed with sweet twenty-three d'ye mind long jack greener him as they called knockabout as gone for a soldier and mast bridgeman down pentworth way what had little sally bridgeman for a daughter poor man as gone out o jack so folks say the geese ate fine and juicy michaelmas time as i told ye i would and ye ne'er come along though ye gie ye solemn word but lor i hain't told ye o the partlets twere twins last time as be like you'll recommember and now tis twins again foul within a twelvemonth and such a innocent unadventurous looking little man so she ran on like a downland brook whose bright water comes from nowhere apparently just out of the bare hillside but makes such a sparkle and tintinabulation through the dull array of winter woods presently the room fell dark a great wagon-load of straw trusses had drawn up outside cutting off the sunshine as though someone had clapped the shutters to a new voice sounded in the bar and the landlady turned away who is that with the wagon i asked her when she got back to her post of surveillance tis miles's carter taken wheat straw to the railroad the old skinflint robbin the land again as allers do ask him whether he is going to amberley or fittleworth will you the answer came back amberley cause a want hat a go by the bailiffs i got my rucksack hastily to my shoulder amberley was on the direct route to arundel and the wagon would take me more than half the remainder of my way five minutes later i had climbed to the top of the rustling golden mountain and was voyaging down the road feeling like an allegorical figure of husbandry on a processional car of the experiences and exploits narrated in these pages there are few that i would not gladly repeat but this ride on the straw wagon is one of them there was no difficulty in getting to the top of the load for the trusses made a succession of steps and there was none in keeping there for i sat wedged in deep between two of the highest bundles and moreover there were stout cross ropes by which to hold on as far as concerned the thing itself i was as comfortable and as safe as i had been on the tailboard of the furniture van 
where i had ridden on the first day of my jaunt all my troubles were extraneous ones the wagoner held fairly to the middle of the road and had warned me to keep a lookout for overhanging branches but with all his care and all my vigilance i had some very narrow escapes sometimes a depending bough would snatch a vicious handful of straw from the truss close to my head and sometimes we plunged as it were right into the treetop and i had to duck down while a scarring hurtling wave of brown oak leaves swept our decks fore and aft then at a corner of the way where telegraph lines crossed the road the wires sang their venomous song right in my ear and were gone before i had even guessed their propinquity far less prepared for it altogether it was a nerve-bracing experience and full of a strange delight one who has led our armies in the frontier wars of india has now in his leisured age a house full of memories in the form of paintings of those wild arenas and wilder times these he made on his own battlefields after and often before his work was done and he tells how he would sit placidly sketching while an occasional sniping bullet cut the turf around him or rattled among the rocks i never fully appreciated these stories until i had that lift on the wagon load of straw for the afternoon was of a magnificent golden tranquillity and the view from my crow's nest such as it were hard to better even in the sussex weald we moved through a smiling vale of plenty where wood and farmland and rich pasture intermingled so variously that the eye was never tired to my right ran the hill chain of the downs no longer green but afloat now in the misty amber of the declining light and leftward lay the broad weald rippled over with the winter purple of woodlands and green of blunting corn and rich umber of new-turned ploughland until all was merged in the far-off blue sierra of the northern downs all this i had constantly to keep under my eye and faithfully to study not missing if i could help it a single facet of its beauty the while at any moment some rustling maze of dry foliage would swoop down upon me or some pendulous bare branch try a sniping shot at me that was to be circumvented only by instant dexterous burrowing in the straw the wagon moved but at a tortoise gait it was well past sundown before we climbed the last steep hill into the village of houghton and pulled up as by instinct outside the george and dragon inn thence to the wagon's destination was barely another mile it was hardly worth the trouble to mount to my perch again so here i let the wagon go on without me i watched it down the lane and over the green brooklands beyond i followed its dwindling bulk with my eyes until it rumbled over the old stone bridge that here spans the river arran until it disappeared finally in the grey twilight beyond there goes my last lift thought i the last of near upon threescore happy rides over more than two hundred miles and with it must go the good vagabond times now i must put on respectability like a garment i must shave again get back to linen collars and boot polish take up once more my part in the game of citizenship strut on the footways and cure myself of lounging joyfully along the middle of the roads it seemed a direful fate just then and when i came to the river i stopped and leaned over the weather-worn parapet of the bridge to think about it 
the night was falling fast hardly a sound broke the stillness around me as i looked down into the water and saw there my own black reflection set about with the brightness of the stars the river was at its full flood tide between its reedy banks the water lay in one motionless breadth that seemed to have gathered to it the light of all the spangled heaven looking about me at the wide circle of the hills i saw now that the night had shut down upon everything only in the glassy depths of the water lingered any vestige of that long sun-steeped day and this i stood and watched greedily until the last of it had vanished and there was nothing above nor below me but darkness and the quivering silver of the stars i will go on said i when the tide turns when old aaron begins to move townwards he and i will go there side by side and when the first clear-voiced ripple of the ebbing water sounded below me i turned and struck into the river path for the last stage home end of chapter twenty four End of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards.